You know, Canada has a really very good legislation on sanctions. There's about 10 countries, other than the ones that are sanctioned by the United Nations, that Canada is sanctioning for violation of human rights. So the mechanism exists to force the Canadian government to respect human rights and to ensure respect by the State of Israel of human rights. Lies at the heart, at the intersection of three continents, which at one time were the only known world. Europe, Asia, and Africa. Europe up there, Asia here, Africa here. So, it was only natural that every empire, every conqueror, every dynasty, Every invader has had their chance to rule and establish their country there. You know, when, when, when uh, my Zionist friends tell me, we have history here, we used to have a country here. Well, during the time of David and Solomon, there was a kingdom that lasted about 150 years uh, in Palestine that was deliberately and clearly a Jewish sovereignty. But I tell them, you know, in addition to you, the Egyptians, the Saudis, the Iraqis, the Syrians, the Persians, the Turks, Italy, uh, Turkey, Italy, uh, Greece, the and Syria, and the Assyrians, they all had sovereignties there that lasted more than two or three hundred years. But it gets really bad when they tell me, ah, but there is a religious attachment. One time every year, the Jews say, next year in Jerusalem. And they're right. But they don't realize that five times every single day, Muslims look to Mecca to pray. That doesn't give them any political rights in Saudi Arabia or its oil wealth. So remember that one at least. But the truth is, Jerusalem has always been special to many people. Religiously special. It was the, basically the cradle of all three monotheistic religions. The problem comes when we translate that religious attachment into a political movement that justifies our imperial designs, that justifies our conquest, that justifies in the name of God or Allah or Jehovah, that we capture Jerusalem and kick out the infidels. It's funny, all three relay, uh, 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 refer to everybody else as infidels. And we Christians are the worst. Because we don't have just one group that says Jews and Muslims are infidels. We have many churches. The Catholics think that the Orthodox are infidels. And the Orthodox think that the Catholics and the, the, the different uh, parties are all equally uh, abhorrent in God's sight. I was told... Uh, at Trinity, actually, by one student after I made my presentation that you know our God is a jealous God. Yes, he's a jealous. And I think God would be very jealous as to how his name is being abused by other Christians more than Muslims or Jews or anybody else. So, the struggle in Palestine, Israel must be recognized as first and foremost a political struggle. There are those who use religions and it's a very useful tool. It's useful because you can get the masses riled up. It's useful also because if you can convince somebody 
that this is what God wants, then nothing else matters. The fact that it's illogical, inhuman, against international law, such a minority position, has no chance of succeeding, are all irrelevant. Because God said it. And I believe it, and that settles it. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I'm used to hearing this from my fellow Christian evangelicals. But we also hear it from Muslims who say this is God's word. This is what Allah said. Are you going to say, you're going to tell me that international law is more important than Allah? The Universal Declaration was written by human beings. And God is superior. Actually, I can say that the truly religious in all three faiths have really moved away from these positions over the years. And, and I'll start with the Jews. The Jews, after the destruction of the Second Temple, realized that their form of temple worship no longer served the Jewish people at all. And so they adjusted their thinking. And the synagogue became the center of Jewish life rather than the temple. This allowed them to go and live in many countries throughout the world and be loyal citizens of their different countries because their Jewish identity was no longer tied up with a tribal and a territorial position. The rabbis actually went through the Old Testament and sort of locked away some of the more toxic verses that I'm sure you're all aware of that give us trouble as Christians today and said these are no longer relevant. God wants us to have ethical, moral behavior. And so Jews proceeded to become very important elements in the religious and ethical and moral life of many countries throughout the world where they served with loyalty and with honesty. But not only Jews, Christians also, if they listened to what Jesus said, would also move away from that territorial-based religion. In fact, Jesus was specifically asked by the Samaritan woman at the well, for those of you who know their Bible. Uh, she said, you're a, you, you're a prophet, clearly, you know everything. Where should I worship God? Here in Samaria, in Nablus, or in Jerusalem, as the Jews say? And Jesus said, the time has come which is now. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what counts, not the location. Jesus, you know, many people say, oh, you're, uh, this is supersessionism. You're saying that the church now replaces the Jewish people, that God doesn't care about Jews, he only cares about the church. Not at all. Jesus came as a Jewish rabbi to expand the concept of God's love and caring, to include other people and to include other lands. John 3.16, for God so loved the Jewish people, right? No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that those who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Anyway. Christians did not heed this testimony. To the contrary, we have the example of the Crusades where they went and destroyed and pillaged and burnt and raped and did the most horrible things in the name of Christ and the cross to save the Holy Sepulcher, the sacred burial place of Jesus from the infidels. I am pleased that today very few Christians are in that mode, except for Christian Zionists 
who still want to revive the idea of, of a Jewish attachment to the Holy Temple, most Christians today are not interested in capturing Jerusalem on behalf of Christianity, taking it away from Islam or Judaism. But Muslims have actually a similar approach. Again, it's not that Jerusalem is not important to them, it's very important. It used to be the first Qubla, the first place where people turned to prayer before it became Mecca. It has the third most important and sacred Haram Sharif in Islam. In fact, some Muslims say that you cannot properly do the Hajj, the pilgrimage, unless you stop by in Jerusalem. So it is important, Jerusalem, to Muslims. I used to think it was important to 1.2 billion Muslims, but that gives away my age. Muslims today are 1.8 billion people who cannot be ignored. But you know, the thing about Muslims and Islam is that it is also a universal religion. If any of you have read the book, The Secret of Pi, uh, you'd remember that the Hindu boy was most attracted in Islam by the fact that the Muslims rolled their prayer carpet under their arm. And so you can be anywhere. And you stop, you lay out the carpet, you point towards Mecca, and you pray. Because God exists everywhere, not only in the mosque or the masjid. He exists everywhere. So, if that's the case, why is it that everybody thinks Jerusalem is so central and such an obstacle uh, to making peace in the Middle East? The reality is that Jerusalem is not an obstacle. The only obstacle is exclusivity. When I, as an Arab, or a Jew, or a Christian, say this is mine and mine alone, and nobody else has any rights here. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It becomes mine, which means I need to bring more of my people to live and settle in it, and push out any of the other groups out from it. That I have to take away their residency rights. That I have to literally push them out. That I, once I have the power to issue licenses and building permits, I don't give building permits to the Arabs and I only give them to the Jews. To increase the Jews in the holy city. And the Arabs will have to either leave or build illegally, which means I can move in and destroy their homes anytime I want. This idea of exclusivity is what is troubling uh, to people. And then comes Trump. The thing about President Trump, your neighbor to the south, on top of his many, 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 many problems is that uh, he doesn't actually think through what he says. And he has fallen under the influence of a number of people who are not only Zionist or pro-Israeli, but who belong to the most fanatical wing of right-wing Zionism including his ambassador Friedman, who lives in a settlement, his son-in-law Jared, his uh, special advisor Bolton. Uh, all these people have tied themselves to groups that really don't care about peace, certainly, <laughs> about justice for sure, ultimately about Israel. They care for what they want. And let me explain. In 1967, when Israel captured 
the Haram al-Sharif and the old city, uh, the Israeli government had a problem because Zionists really were secular people. They didn't care. Uh, David Ben-Gurion was, was a well-known atheist. He used to say, I don't believe in God, but I believe he gave us this land. He used to hold a Bible study in his home every Thursday because it was political convenience. Well, what do you do? Now you've captured Jerusalem. Do you take it over? Do you destroy the Dome of the Rock and build a third temple? This is crazy. Do you start a religious war with 1.8 billion Muslims? No, 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 we don't want to do that. So they came up with a very lovely fatwa, fatwa, religious uh, teaching. The chief rabbi in Israel announced that since the temple, if, if you remember in the Old Testament, the temple had three courtyards, the outer courtyard for the Gentile, the inner courtyard, the holy place, and the center of it was the Holy of Holies. One place that is so sacred, so holy, only the chief rabbi can enter and only once a year to expiate for the sins of his people. In fact, they were so afraid that God didn't want people to abuse this place that uh, he used to wear bells and used to be tied in a rope. When he would go in to worship once a year after doing all the sacrifices, they would listen to the bells to know that he is still alive. And if the bell stopped, it means God has struck him dead and they need to pull him with the rope because nobody else can enter. Well, wonderful fatwa. The chief rabbi said, since we don't know exactly where the temple was and the Holy of Holies, it shall be forbidden for anybody of the Jewish faith to step anywhere in the compound. Lovely answer. Good religious answer to what otherwise would have been a major political problem. And if you go there to Jerusalem today, you will see the signs that says it shall be forbidden for anybody of the Jewish faith to enter into the compound. He also allowed the Jordanian Awqaf, the Waqf religious department, to continue to run things in the Haram al-Sharif. That was his way of keeping the Palestinians out because they had good relations with uh, Jordan and this was their way of making uh, some gesture towards Jordan, uh, but not to the Palestinians. There, were, there was a very small, tiny minority who were called the custodian of the Temple Mount, Umana Jabal al-Haykal. These people were of the fanatic variety that I mentioned. These people said we need to destroy the Dome of the Rock and set up a temple in its place. We need to start preparing vestments for priests and we need to look for a red heifer, that's a red cow without any blemish, to use it as a sacrifice. People thought of them as really crazy fanatics. In fact, the Shin Bet, the Israeli uh, security services, were very worried about these people and fully infiltrated them to find out what they're doing. And they twice discovered a conspiracy to blow up the Dome of the Rock. Once 200 kilograms of dynamite were found on the roof of one of the yeshivas, 200 meters from the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall. And another, there was an Israeli pilot who was taking uh, test runs over the Dome of the Rock uh, in preparation for dropping a bomb. They managed to stop them both times. But now, again, I come to the age of Trump. These fanatics, who really have no appreciation and no understanding, 
for the political reality are no longer a small fringe minority. They have become mainstream in Israeli society. They even have joined the government and they sit with the government as ministers in the government. And they are increasingly moving in with more and more numbers to try and physically take over the Dome of the Rock, which would be a huge catastrophe for everyone concerned. Trump comes along and says, I have the deal of the century. I'm going to solve this problem. How do I solve this problem? Basically by defining it as no longer there. Jerusalem is important. I'll move the embassy and I tell everybody Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. It's the eternal capital of the Jewish people. It's off the table. It's not going to be negotiated. See? I solved that problem. Nobody has to worry about it. Another problem is the settlements that are all over the West Bank that were always a source of tension between America and the United States because they undermine the two-state solution, no problem. They can build their settlements wherever they want to. I no longer object. It's up to them what they want. Two states, one state, I don't care. They can build settlements wherever they want. I'm done. Settlements are not a problem. What else? Borders, who cares where the borders are? It all is under Israel's control. There will never be a Palestinian state no matter what. Refugees, no problem. We'll change the definition of who is a refugee. If you were living in 1948, yes, you're a refugee, but your children and grandchildren and progeny are not refugees. See, we took care of another problem by defining it out of the table. This is the deal of the century. He thinks he has all the power to force the Palestinians, the international community, and the rest of the world to do whatever Israel wants. By force, by power, by bullying, by cutting off whatever financial help other people have. Palestine, which used to be basically all Arab until 1947, was faced with an onslaught of Jewish immigration that was linked to anti-Semitism in Europe, Christian anti-Semitism in Europe. And let me explain that, it's very important for us to know. Anti-Semitism is a vile movement, it's an evil movement that should be resisted anywhere and everywhere it is. Anti-Semitism says that Jews don't belong in the countries where they are, that Jews are cursed by God and deserve what happens to them. That Jews are not really true Canadians, true Americans, true Germans, true French, true whatever. That they should be kicked out, eliminated. Now you must understand that the anti-Semitic movement was not a Middle Eastern phenomena or a Muslim phenomena. The pogroms took place in, where the pogroms took place? Russia, the Inquisition, where people were tortured and forced to become Christian, took place in Spain. Spain. And ultimately the Holocaust took place in Germany. So Palestinians were saying, look, this is not our problem. We didn't cause this. We don't want all these people to come and take our land. But that what they didn't realize is that these people were desperate. The adrenaline was flowing. They had friends in very high places and they were going to create this place one way or another. And so they appealed to the British 
And the British said, we can't do anything about this. We return it to the UN. And we divided a partition plan into a Jewish state, the white state, and an Arab state, and leave Jerusalem as a corpus separatum, as a special place, international. Remember, Jerusalem is too important to give to anybody. And the Arabs howled, what are you doing? This is awful. You're taking half and the better half of my country and giving it to these recent settler colonialists. So a fighting broke out and the Jews used this opportunity to push out Arabs from all the area that was supposed to be a Jewish state and then take some more land. The Arab armies then tried to, co uh, to move in to protect the Arab area and the Arabs lost. The Israelis will tell you that the Arabs started the war by fighting the state of Israel before it was created. The historians will tell you that most of these villages were emptied and ethnically cleansed even before the Arab armies came in. Regardless, the truth is, once they were pushed out, they were kept out. And the state of Israel was created. And Palestinians became refugees in their own, in, in the different Arab countries, in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Welfare Agency, was created to provide for their services. In 1967, and I'll go through this very quickly, the war started, which the Arabs will tell you, they call it Al-Udwan, Al-Thulafi, that this is the aggression that Israel attacking the Arab countries. And the Israelis will tell you it was a preemptive war that we knew they were going to attack us, so we attacked them first. Regardless, Israel won, and they captured all the West Bank, all of Gaza, and a big chunk of Sinai and the Golan Heights. So now, once again, people started thinking about the two-state solution. That maybe what we need is one state for the Jews and one state for the Arabs. For many Arabs, that was not at all a good idea. Because that leaves them with 22% of Palestine, while Israel has 78% of Palestine. Regardless, after some hemming and hawing, that became the accepted position, the two-state solution. That somehow we need to solve this problem vertically. One part for Israel, one part for Palestine, and they live in peace forever after. It's called peace for land. The only problem is that many Zionists says, why should we? We are in, in control of all this area. Why shouldn't we start living and taking over more and more of the lands in the West Bank and Gaza? This is what they call settlements. Now, the rest of the world didn't like it. Even the United States said that this is illegal. You can't come and start building Jewish settlements all over this area. And the Israelis used a lot of deception. They said, we don't want to take this land. This is just a temporary measure until the Arabs accept us and recognize us and we'll give them an, a, a Palestinian state. So they kept taking more and more land and building more and more settlements. And these settlements, you must understand, are Jewish settlements. They're not Israeli settlements. Only Jews are allowed to live in those settlements. The entire world, under international law, considers these settlements as illegal and an obstacle to peace. But Israelis said, who cares? Who cares about international law? Who cares about Palestinian rights? We have the power. We can do it. Today, they, the, when the Palestinians rebelled and they started the first intifada, Israel entered an agreement called the Oslo Agreement. The Oslo Agreement said 
that these areas that you see, the brown areas, which are very densely populated, we're going to turn over to the Palestinians to become the nucleus of a Palestinian state. We will allow them to run elections as long as they elect the right people. If they elect the wrong people like they did in Gaza, woe unto them. We will slowly give them more and more areas and expand their control into what's called Area B. Area B, about 23% of the West Bank, are these green areas that have Palestinian peasants and villages built up areas. Everything else, the rest of the West Bank, is called Area C, which will continue under full Israeli control. This is where the settlers were living, and this is where all the land in between is allowed. If you notice, the white areas are all connected to each other and to Israel. The green areas and the brown areas are totally disjointed and do not connect with each other and cannot and will not form a Palestinian state. But the deception was continuing the whole time. Every Israeli government, right wing and left, were saying, just, you know, we just need the right partner. We just need the right conditions. We need the right guarantees to be given to us. Meanwhile, they were continuing to take more and more and more land. Today, 25 years after the Oslo process, that process has failed totally and completely. 50 years after the 67 war, the two-state solution no longer makes any sense. 70 years after the creation of the State of Israel, there is a vibrant Jewish state that serves Jews and Jews only at the expense of non-Jews. The recent nation-state law makes it absolutely clear there is no subterfuge. We won't talk about equality. We won't talk about accommodation others. This place is for Jews. Palestine doesn't exist, only Israel exists. And it exists for Jews and Jews only. Only Jews are entitled to self-determination in Eretz Israel. Only Hebrew is the official language. We control everything. The borders, the air, the water, and for those Palestinians who have the temerity to think that they can do something like Hamas, we will have a tight siege upon them. The United Nations has said by 2020, Gaza will be unlivable. I think it's unlivable today. Because Gaza, if you can imagine, this area is 30 miles long, three to five miles wide, and it has two million people living there. Two million. Israel controls the sea, the air, all the borders, including this little border with Egypt, in coordination with Egypt. Nobody can go in and out without their permission. No goods are allowed in or out without their permission. No utilities, no fuel is allowed in or out without their permission. In fact, only four hours of electricity are allowed in Gaza. Can you live on four hours of electricity? If I go to, to my office and there's no electricity, I lock the door and go home. There's, what's the point? I cannot live without electricity or internet. I don't know about you guys. 
people in Gaza, 2 million are being asked to live without electricity. Water, the whole water table has sunk because Israel controls the water table and now 95% of the water in Gaza is not potable, cannot be drunk. They cannot process their sewage because there's no fuel allowed for the sewage processing plant. And if they try to build some tunnels to get in and out and bring stuff in and out, why Israel says this is the excuse to stop from allowing them to have any construction materials. In fact, Israel determines which materials are allowed in and how much. Two years ago, they were controlling how much food goes in including spaghetti, spaghetti, macaroni, which kind they will allow in. Only 96 items were being allowed. And somebody said to the Israeli general, are you trying to starve them? And he says, no, we want to put them on a very strict diet. I thought he was joking. I thought this was a cruel joke. Later I found out that they actually had studies. The Israeli army had studies. How many calories are required to keep people just at the edge of starvation. And that was used to calculate how many truckloads of food they will allow in and out. Those of you who follow the news know about the Great March of Return. The Great March of Return is a non-violent movement of Palestinians saying, we want to go home, we want to break the siege. We want to live like human beings. We don't have weapons, we don't have guns, we don't have bombs, we don't have anything. <laughs> some of the young people decided to use balloons and put some fuel in balloons to burn. Then Israel went berserk. You're not allowed to have these incendiary balloons. That's terrorism. Meanwhile, continuously over the skies of Gaza, Israeli drones are circulating day in and day out and they drop not balloons, they drop rockets and munitions and bombs. Last Friday, seven people were killed on the fence. Two of them, one is 12 years old and one is 14 years old. Now these people got too close to the fence and under Israel's rules anybody who moves too close we shoot them but under international law that's not the rule the rule is you shoot when your life is in, in danger you shoot when there is a threat to you not when somebody refuses to follow your dictates and enters into a, an arbitrary line that you tell them they cannot uh, enter. Israel also uses all sorts of ammunition, including the butterfly ammunition, which goes in and expands inside the body and just wrecks all the different organs of the body. What I want to tell you is that there is a paradigm shift that it is no longer possible to have a two-state solution 700,000 Israeli Jews are now living in the occupied territories including East Jerusalem they're not going anywhere the Israeli government is not taking them out and nobody is planning to remove them. Not only that, they're living there under their own set of laws and rules. They have a network of roads that connect them to each other and to Israel where they can zip along without even seeing or confronting a Palestinian Arab at all. These roads are only for Jews. They have a separate educational system and a separate health system for them that does not serve the Palestinian Arabs. 
they also have separate laws that apply to them. Palestinians are subject to military law and in the green areas to Palestinian civilian law which has no jurisdiction over settlers or Jews. So the laws are different, the courts are different, the police are different, the roads are different. If somebody were to come from Mars and look at this whole area today, what will they see? Other than the history of it, they will see two groups living in this area. One group who are Jews and they have all the rights. They have a democratic life, high level of uh, living. They can live anywhere they want. And they are subject to their own laws and regulations and benefits. And they see another people who are not Jews. I have to use that. I, it bothers me because I am used to distinguishing between Jewish and Zionist and Israeli. And I'm very careful in making those distinctions. But if you live in Palestine, those distinctions are not made. Israel doesn't ask you, are you Israeli or are you Zionist? They only ask you one question, are you Jewish or not? If you're Jewish, there's one set that applies to you. And if you're not Jewish, there's another set of laws that applies to you. So we have to be careful what, we, what language we use because we now have a situation where in Israel, Palestine, Jews as Jews have rights which are denied to non-Jews simply because they are not Jewish. I used to say that the Zionist movement and the Palestinian nationalist movement who have been fighting for 10 years have reached a cusp. Neither movement can destroy the other. Palestinian Arabs can say Palestine Arabiyya. Palestine is Arab. And all these settler colonialists who came in during the last 70 years, 100 years, don't belong here. They should go back wherever they came from. That doesn't work anymore. They're there, and they're there to stay. And for them, this is their home. This is their home. I am so moved every time I hear the land acknowledgments that you do in Canada before I speak. Just the fact that you are acknowledging that you are settler colonialists living on somebody else's land solves 90% of the problem. Palestinians would like for the Israelis to say we are settler colonialists. We're living on your land, but we have to. Because of anti-Semitism, because of religious reasons, because of historical reasons, because of whatever reasons we are here and we are staying. But we acknowledge that, yeah, yeah, we, we took this land from you. By the same token, the Zionist goal that used to say, Eretz Yisrael Am Yisrael, the land of Israel for the people of Israel, whether it's because God gave it to us, or history gave it to us, or the British gave it to us, Lord Belfort, or because international law gave it to us, or because we took it by force, or whatever reason, it is ours. We are here and the one to make Israel as France is French, as Jewish as France is French. These people used to believe that, uh, or at least pretend, that it's a land without a people for a people to without a land. Now they know better. They know that we exist and we have an identity and we have a presence which they cannot remove anymore. The train has left the station. Israel is living an anachronism. You can no longer carry out ethnic cleansing in large enough numbers to make any difference. Zionism needs to change and to accept the fact that the state of Israel is Jewish 
and Arab. Just like I have to accept that Palestine is both Arab and Jewish. Today in Palestine, I need to recognize we have two million here, three million here, another two million here. Half the people between the river and the sea are Arab. And then they're going nowhere. And for Jews also. For me as an Arab, I have to recognize that half the people between the river and the sea are Jewish. And they're going nowhere. We must find a way to live together and we can and we will. But we won't do it if we hang on to the two-state paradigm because it's not going to happen. There will not be a Palestinian state. I have a very good uh, friend of mine from Winnipeg, a Canadian who was the MCC country director, Harold Jewick. Five years ago he told me, you know what I tell my Israeli friend these days? Guys, you won. There's not going to be a Palestinian state. What are you going to do now? You won. You made sure you undermined at every turn in the road any possibility of a Palestinian state. So what do you do now? You want apartheid? Or you want equality? And if it's equality, you have to deal with the reality that half the people in your state are not Jewish. This is, this is what I meant when I said we are at the point of a paradigm shift. We must start thinking in new terms. The old terms don't work. Palestine can no longer be divided into two states. It is, the, in reality and in truth, one state only. Just one state with one side having all the power and the other side having none of the power. But that doesn't bother me, you know? It really doesn't. Because the world has changed. The world has changed. Apartheid today is a war crime and a crime against humanity. The International Criminal Court today, Article 3, considers apartheid a war crime and a crime against humanity. And there's no veto and the ICC, the United States will not be able to save the Israeli leaders and politicians and army people when they, when they are brought before the ICC. And they will be, and they will be. I challenge you all, do you know any politician today, any person today, who's willing to admit that 25 years ago they supported apartheid? Nobody, nobody. Theresa May was recently at Robben Island, and then you should look at that and, on uh, YouTube. And one, uh, one journalist uh, said, uh, Theresa May, you were very active in politics when, uh, when Mandela was in jail here. What did you do to get him released? Said, well, you know, the British government. No, 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 no. What did you do? Did you demonstrate? Did you sign petitions? Did you bring the issue up in Parliament? You are part of the Conservative Party that considered him a terrorist. Well, you have to understand. No, I don't have to understand. Tell me. Did you support apartheid or didn't you? Nobody today is willing to say they supported apartheid. Nobody is going to say that they supported the kind of evil violations that are in a system that is built in and based on racism and discrimination. Doesn't happen. Cannot happen. Will not happen. Even those who are totally pro-Israeli. You know, there's a uh, legislation in the United States called uh, No Way to Treat a Child. And then there's a letter also in the uh, Canadian MPs that the kind of treatment that Palestinian children get under military law are really totally abhorrent. When the army comes in in the middle of the night, bangs up and goes in and yanks these children, 12 and 10 and 14 out of their bed after midnight, 
blindfolds them, takes them, throws them in the jeeps and takes them away to be interrogated, not in the presence of a lawyer or their parents, and forced to sign a confession in Hebrew against their will. 50 years we've had military law. And even if they don't sign, they can be under what's called administrative detention, which means they can be arrested, no charges, no trial, for six months renewable. This has to stop. I will put it to you, this will stop. The campaign for no way to treat a child, the campaign for lifting the siege of Gaza, and other campaigns calling on the Canadian government through the anti -BD, through the BDS movement to begin to start beginning to respect human rights. You know, Canada has a really very good legislation on sanctions. There's about 10 countries, other than the ones that are sanctioned by the United Nations, that Canada is sanctioning for violation of human rights. So the mechanism exists to force the Canadian government to respect human rights and to ensure respect by the State of Israel of human rights.